Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Eugene Levy of having a bevy, Jack Slack. It's the Jack Slack podcast. We're coming at you on Monday, the 6th of September, and we're talking about the fights that happened at the weekend, as we often do on this podcast. Um, some, yeah, not very notable fights, to be honest. It wasn't big names all around, but some interesting stuff happened, particularly uh, in glory. Um, but... Uh, uh, you know, you, you get a good half hour of me seething about Derek Brunson winning another fight. <laughs> there were people misunderstanding my hatred of Brunson on uh, Twitter, being like, oh, you're just bias. Not bias, duh, bias. You're just bias for the Scouser. And I'm like, yes, me, Jack Slack, noted Scouser. Um, no, the truth is I just don't like when Derek Brunson wins in spite of running in with his chin up at the fucking ceiling. However, when he gets to the mat, he's pretty good. So we're going to we're going to talk about that um and you know just sort of like how shit the middleweight division is outside of the top 2 guys who are like pound for pound greats. Robert Whittaker is one of the best rounded fighters who's ever fought in this sport. Israel Adesanya is a bit more of a specialist, but still one of the most talented and skilled fighters to ever compete in this sport. And then it's just dirge from from number three down. But anyway, we'll start at the top. Darren Till versus Derek Brunson, two extremely one-dimensional fighters. Um, we talked a lot about this on the boycast, and I let I, and the preview went up on the um, regular podcast feed. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out. But um, yes, we were talking about how Derek, Darren Till, not a very, well, this is going to be a theme this week when we start talking about Zhang uh, uh, Nan, but not a very varied striker. It's ones and twos. It's mainly the straight left and um, being very fucking fast. Like all his setups are just sort of flapping his hands. Um, the lack of variety has been a bit of a problem. But the speed is still very real. You know, the thing was that, like, he hasn't won a lot of fights lately, but people still, like, his opponents still very much see him as a threat because of the speed. And he's definitely going to be getting to the point where people, the fan generally, disregards him and the fighters are like, well, no, he's still a really dangerous fight because of the speed. Um, you know, if, if you were managing someone now in the middleweight division, like, it's not worth fighting Darren Till for almost no recognition now. Um, and Derek Brunson's the opposite end, like amazing wrestling, but really that's all, I mean, he does sort of, like he's got power on the feet, but generally just sort of runs in behind his chin. We were really impressed by his Edmund Shabazian performance. And then last fight and this fight, it was back to more of the same. Very strange. It was one of those like one night only great performances. Well, this fight started out exactly how you'd expect. It was the speed of Brun uh, sorry, the speed of Till Brunson freaking out with his reactions, like you know, ducking way down, picking his hands way up, sort of like leaning back away from um, Till, and then he timed a good takedown attempt. Uh, well, it wasn't even actually that good. Uh, if you watch the first takedown attempt, he goes at Till. Till puts both hands up in a high guard, and then realizes, oh shit, he's going for my hips, and he he's basically catches him dead to rights and just pulls his legs out. But most of this fight, I would say, was decided by, one, the Till takedown defense not being up to snuff. Um, it, it's interesting because, like, the Styles make fights thing is real. You know, um, Kelvin Gastelum was trying to get Darren Till off his feet and Darren Till was doing a great job of stopping him. Um, but then you've seen, like, Israel Adesanya, Derek Brunson couldn't do anything against him. I mean, he did sort of, like, get him to like a hand on the mat at several points, but he couldn't keep him down at all. Whereas uh, Till, he was able to get off his feet quite often. You know, the, the second round, Till stopped about three takedowns in a row, but it's the thing we always talk about. Like, if you stop a takedown and you can't disengage, you're just going to, they're going to attempt another takedown on you. Um, you haven't benefited in any way from that. You're just still in the wrestling exchange um, or you've prolonged it, if anything. And then the other side of it is like, can you get up off? Can you get up off the mat? You know there have been examples of guys who are not the best at stopping takedowns, but they're pretty good at getting back up afterwards. Until well, he stopped a couple in the second round, but generally couldn't stop these takedowns. And when he hit the mat, he had no way of getting back up. Um, you know he, he did uh, turtle and get back up in the was it the second round? 
Well, the first. But basically, he spent the entire time on the underside of half guard. And if you watch the very first takedown, uh, Till ends up sort of like on his side, and his guard's not really there. Brunson could like try and burst past his guard and pin him to the mat from like side control. But Brunson sort of waits for Darren Till to hook his leg and catch the half guard, which is very common because especially amongst wrestlers, because as we always talk about, half guard is a position is a position where you can hold the guy in place. Um, side control is obviously a pin, but it's a chest to chest pin. If you don't have controls like on the upper body, the guy can roll away from you and start doing a, a get up, which isn't a big deal in jujitsu uh, and certainly not in um, most nogi competitions, maybe a bit more of a problem in ADCC. But in MMA, that's a huge deal. You know, that, that's the Kelvin Gastelum game. Let the guy pass my guard if he takes me down, because I'll roll to my belly and, and start getting up on my hands and knees. But Till's approach here was very, very old school. Um, it was just sort of like trying to use the half guard. And in the very early going, he's trying to get under um, Brunson's legs. Like So uh, if you remember how Shogun used to play the half guard, but loads of guys used to do it, like the old deep half guard, where you... Um, get an underhook on one on the side where you've got the leg trapped and then you try and underhook their other leg so your your hand is going under their leg deep and uh, guys get murdered from there especially in the modern era but like uh, Bigfoot Silver versus Kane Velasquez Jose Aldo sorry um Pequino Nogueiro versus Jose Aldo I mean Shogun against John Jones there's loads of examples of guys digging underneath the leg the other guy sit. The guy on top sits back and just elbows them in the head for free, and that happened a little bit in this one. And then you saw later on from the half guard when Darren wasn't reaching under the leg, uh, Brunson would do the old school team quest move of trying to drive his his free leg, his knee over Darren's arm and put him into a sort of crucifix position, which is very hard to hold and control, but you can still land some good shots. The other thing that you saw loads of from. Um, Brunson was the half guard generally I mean it's a lot of positions half guard in the sense of playing half guard from the bottom you have to have something checking the distance or controlling where the opponent's weight is so that you can start moving and and either building up or getting underneath them with a sweep if you're flat on your back and there's nothing between you and the opponent you're not playing half guard <laughs> you're just getting smashed that's a pin um so there's a, an awful lot of scope in what half guard can be and that's why people like it so much because it's so different to being in like the closed guard where yes you can lean in and pin the guys back to the mat but you don't have an awful lot of control over him because his hips are in the way uh, there's lots of moving parts whereas when you're sitting on one leg you can pin his back to the mat if you clear if you clear his knee his top leg out of the way uh, and that's what you saw Brunson doing a lot in this fight he kept walking back towards Till's hips, so Till would keep trying to put his free knee, the one that wasn't underneath uh, Brunson, he'd keep trying to put his top knee in to create space with what's called the knee shield, and Brunson would keep walking towards his hips and pointing that knee up at the ceiling. So the knee wanted to come across in front of, uh, of Brunson, either at his hips or his chest, and Brunson kept walking it out so that it was pointing up at the ceiling. Brunson stayed inside the thigh of it. And from that flat pinning position, you can just sit there and maul the guy with elbows from the, the hand that's nearest his head, or you can sit up and crack him with a big, um, well, it would have been Brunson's left hand, but the hand that's back, one hand is always back in sort of the half guard position. Um, so yeah, and then this, the kind of half guard, that, um, the kind of half guard that Till was playing or, or getting to over and over again from the bottom position was uh, like a low knee shield, which is another big difference between uh, MMA and no gi grappling even if you watch um gordon ryan or craig jones is obviously the most famous example but lots of guys in no gi like the low knee shield which is where you have the half guard you've got the knee in the way the top knee in the way of the opponent but you have it down by the hips and you can keep their hips back you can pull them forward and start looking for leg attacks um but it's, i mean it's a great position you've got like a clamp on their hip and leg but in MMA, there's nothing to stop them from throwing punches over the top. If you watch um, guys like Ryan Hall uh, when they're in, you know, in their brief moments playing the bottom of half guard in MMA, or when they're talking about it, they like the high knee shield because, it, which is where your knee is up in front of the opponent's chest, or even inside his shoulder, um, because that keeps his chest from coming forward and it stops him from socking you in the head. 
So Till kept like getting on his side, putting in the knee shield at the hip level, and Brunson would just crack him over the top with a big left hand. And by the end of the first round, Till's eye was completely fucked. And it was interesting because even at the end of the second round, there was like 30 seconds left, and Till was trying to do get-ups from half guard. He's trying to make scrambles and get back up. And you're like, is there any point doing that this late in the round? Because if you get back, I mean, if the guy really is going hell for leather to stop you getting up, maybe he tires himself out a bit, which, you know, Brunson did get tired in the third round. But if you succeed in getting up, you've just spent a load of energy doing it for no reason because you're not going to knock him out with one second left on the clock. The other one that you didn't see Till using from half guard, which could have been a big help, was the lockdown. Um, Anderson Silva did it against Daniel Cormier. He did it against a lot of people. You know, you just thread the outside leg over the top of their um, trapped leg and you figure for your legs and stretch them out. And it's not great for sweeping, but it is good for stalling people out, which is what Till was trying to do a lot of the time when he was just sort of like um, doing an upper body clinch, just holding him with his arms. But again, you know, Derek Brunson, scary grappler, not easy to control him on the ground. Um, the third round was when Brunson started to get sort of like tired uh, and looked, well, basically ended up on the feet for too long. Till landed a couple of good left straights, had Brunson reaching out for takedowns that he probably shouldn't. Um, landed a, a few good low kicks, and that was like the first bit of variety in Darren Till's attack. And they they really looked to be bothering Brunson. Brunson was like turning away and going, ooh. Um but then Brunson got the takedown again, uh, having been hit by a good left hand, and Till tried to elevate him with butterfly hooks midway through the, st- the sweep and bounced him off the cage and landed him in mount. And at that point, Till basically gave up. He just sort of like turned his back and let him get the choke. Um, yeah, I mean, hard matchup for Till in terms of like he's not a great wrestler and not a great guard player or, or scrambler upper. Scrambler upper? Um but also, I think this was another one where, if you remember how massive he looked at welterweight, he just looks kind of doughy at middleweight. But Brunson looked like a beast on the ground. The only problem with, like, yeah, the only problem with this is that his striking looked so poor. And yes, he was at a massive speed disadvantage and was struggling. But, like, still, when he throws his weird rear-handed uppercut straight at uh, Till's face, like, his chin is so far forward of his body. You know, when you fight guys like Robert Whittaker and... Israel Adesanya, the guys who did that to him, um, and they can stop your really obvious takedown attempts, you running forward with your chin out is going to get you hurt. And then it was very funny because Dan- uh, Daniel Cormier, who was podcasting all night, was like, ah, oh, D- Derek Brunson wins, never a moment of weakness shown. And he, like, he got really tired and he got hit really badly a few times in that last round. I mean, he dominated and won, but like, maybe don't make it out like he was you know, uh, infallible in that win. Uh, but I mean, that was just the, the the icing on the cake of just bad commentary all night from DC. He was on with Michael Bisping, which might be the first time they've been on together, but he, it was like he was trying to bring the level of Bisping's commentary down. So we'll talk about some of the fights I liked now, actually. Um, Julian Arosa versus Charles, uh, Charles Jourdain. We all knew this was going to be a fun one. But Erosa, I, I couldn't remember an awful lot of details about him fighting. I know he got knocked out quick last time, um, and he fought Nate Landwehr before that. Actually, he beat Nate Landwehr and um, Sean Woodson, so he's beaten two of the memeiest meme fighters in the division. But man, watching him fight this one was like watching a little Matt Brown. I really enjoyed it, and he's got the record to match. Like he's he's got uh, you know thirty fights, lost half of them, has killed some motherfuckers though. Um, yeah, he did an amazing job in this one because Charles Jourdain, obviously flashy kicks, um, jumping knees and shit like that that he's known for, but the flashy kicks are the main issue. And Erosa, we talked about catching kicks last week when we were talking about, um, was it Darren Stewart? Whoever was fighting uh, Dustin Jacoby. Um, we were talking about catching kicks and how guys in MMA aren't doing it enough. And Erosa here was perfect. Like, uh, he, he'd let Jourdain get on Southpaw or when Jourdain got on Southpaw, he would block the the middle kick or high kick or whatever it was on one arm, catch it and draw it across with the other, and then he'd move in on him. And every time he'd move him straight to the to the um the cage. Which is exactly what you want to do. You want to catch the kick and say, Okay, now you're gonna pay for that. You know, <laughs> get on the kick get on that cage, you slag. Um and he did that several times and then later he was catching it and trying to bring it across and Jordan, uh, Jordan would let his uh, hip hinge so that it was just the leg moving because he'd been let like 
he'd been tensing up and um, Arosa had dragged the leg across his body and run to his back. But uh, this time, Jourdain just sort of let his leg go with it. But then he stood on one leg, just sort of rotating at the hip. And um, Arosa's on top of him, hits him with an uppercut left hook and a, and a right elbow, which is something that he was doing over and over again in this one. He was using the uppercut left hook, which is a classic boxing combination. And then he'd let the left hand linger and hang behind the opponent's head and pull them onto a right elbow. And just the amount of elbows and knees he was using as he pressed his man into the cage, um, very Matt Brown for me. But also his use of... Um, he sort of eschewed the jab, which Bisping was saying, like, he's got a five-inch reach advantage. Why is he not jabbing? But he was walking Jourdain down, and he was landing uh, right-hand leads, right hooks to the body, left hooks to the body, stepping right in and going right uppercut left hook or right uppercut left uh, body dig. Um, yeah, he was just he was just murdering him with variety. And, and this is something we're going to get into with Jack Shaw. Like, you don't have to jab, especially if you're, like, losing the jabbing match. You don't have to jab. This is a sport where you have so many weapons available to you. Um, it's just an advantage to have a very strong jab and, and be the better jabber. But, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed what Arosa was doing. Did get dinged a fair few times. Jordan was in it. Like, it, it, was, a, it was a fight where... Um, Arosa was doing a good job of drawing the kicks. So, like, after the first few court kicks got him in and, and allowed him to do some damage or threaten um, back takes along the fence. Uh, he was throwing his own right kicks, which weren't nearly as nasty as Jordan's kicks. But again, it's a tool. If you land your your shitty kick and it brings the opponent back so that you can counter his kick that you, you want to come, um, that has been your kick working better. But Jordan did a good job of just sort of like... Um, banging off the fence so like he'd come back with punches and he'd occasionally cl uh, clip Arosa as he was getting too confident uh, but then Arosa in the third round wasn't wasn't looking for the kick catches so much anymore he just sort of pressed in um, and then he landed a load of really good knees to the body off collar ties and hit a nice takedown um, or sort of like mat return along the fence oh no it was a double leg and he was sort of holding him as Jordan was about to spring up along the fence so it was that sort of like one guy sitting against the fence and the other guy's holding his hips trying to keep him down and Jordan turned his back to try and get up and um, Erosa switched his hands so quickly because um, to from the body lock to the DAS, your your hands basically have to change places. You've got to get them on the opposite sides of the opponent's body again. And he, he basically did it by uppercutting his arm through uh, and, and snatching up this DAS choke super quick. It was very nice. It reminded me of um, Vicente Luke did it to some lad uh, he did it the other way around. He was attacking the Dars and he came up and elbowed him in the head instead as the guy tried to sort of stand out of the Dars. Dars choke, still money. Still one of the best offensive uh, submissions available. That's something you notice, like people who don't enjoy passing guard, they, once they learn the Dars choke, they enjoy passing guard a lot more. I mean, there's countless like guard players or guard playing sensations who then learn the Dars in the course of learning to play the top game in jiu-jitsu. And by learn the dance, I obviously mean make a specialty of it, get really good at it. Um, whenever you say something like that, some pedant will always come along and go, I think they'll have seen the dance before. But yes, Erosa versus Jordan, great fight. Probably deserved fight of the night, but then Molly McCann got fight of the night, and I like her, so, you know, whatever. Um, the other one that everyone's going to ask about, I'm sure, is Paddy Pimblett. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I don't think I included this in the preview, but the, on the boycast we were talking about this fight and Paddy Pimblett, Pimblett generally, um, who I used to quite like because he wore Sakuraba shorts. Oh, actually, before we go on, fucking weird that John Anik uh, and DC and Mike Bisping spent the entire first round of that Arosa Jordan fight, which was a banger, talking about people who died. I understand that a teammate from um, Extreme Couture, you know, he was a he was a staple of the camp, had passed away. They went with that. They went on for about a minute and a half talking about that. Then they switched to Sol Solis and how he died. And then Bisping did a very good job of going, yes, obviously he's very sad, but let's talk about this fight. <laughs> he tried to get him back on track. And then either Anik or DC started talking about how uh, Erosa's dad had died when he was young. Just bizarre. Just Bellator commentary all round. So then Paddy Pimblett gets in there and John Anik draws attention to the fact that he's not wearing orange this time. Almost as if to say, because of our shitty uniform deal, um, he used to wear the Sakuraba trunks and those were very cool. But he's looking absolutely jacked. I remember thinking that the last time I saw him in Cage Warriors. But um, yes, we talked about his losses in Cage Warriors in the boycast. And we were saying like really 
if you put him basically his his strengths are as an offensive wrestler um and as, as a, a top player really good ground pound decent submissions um but his issues have been when guys come out and back him straight up to the fence because what he'll do is he'll try and jab at you and i th- i think the words i used were he really wants to check if his jabs land <laughs> like he he cranes his neck out and raises his chin so that he can try and look over the opponent's guard and be like did did that land and it's the same with his kicks his chin comes way up in the air uh and the more you fluster him and get him close to the fence the more his chin comes up and he starts exchanging and he's not great in the exchanges typically um so what was his name nadwani fuck oh, can't remember his name the 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 end lad Nad Narimani, that's the one. Uh, Nad Narimani, Narimani and Soren Back both had great success backing him up to the fence and just sort of um, picking him off, forcing bad takedown attempts out of him. Um, and he's very, what he's been very good at in his Cage Warriors run, especially like even in, well, you know, you saw it most in those fights where he was having trouble, um, is sort of grinding through. He'll dive on a single leg and he'll really just like, he'll settle in and make it happen over the course of maybe a minute and a half, which I suppose is quite Sakuraba-esque. But um, yes, I, I think people who hadn't seen him fight before would have been very... They might have got the wrong idea of, of, of who he generally is here. Maybe his striking's improved massively. Um, again, this is like opponent-specific stuff. So Vendramini was not doing a great job of crowding him. Um, didn't seem like an awful lot of a threat on the feet, to be honest. But... I, I mean, the commentators were telling me how, what a banger he is, so I'll have to believe them. But uh, Paddy's kicking looked good. And that's the other thing. Like, he really likes to kick a lot. He likes a lot of lead leg kicks, which if you crowd him and put him by the fence, he can't really do as effectively because you're giving up um, easy position, easy takedowns, easy clinches, or just blasting you up the middle with a right straight when you try and um, step up and kick. But uh, Luigi Vendramini, Vendramini was uh, way out in the open, just letting Pimblet get off kicks for free. But the knockout was cracking. Um, and, the, and the thing that I... Yeah, Paddy has always, like, opened himself up to easy counters when he uh, when he unloads his right hand, uh, especially in that in those two where he was back to the fence a lot. But um, it, was, it was good seeing him open up with confidence in this one. He did get hit on the face a lot, but he can crack, so he was, he was okay. Um, now he has a bigger following than Leon Edwards on Twitter already. Bit harsh, because Leon Edwards is actually one of the very best in the world, provably. Um... But yes, it'd be interesting to see where Paddy Pimblett goes from here. I believe he took the decision himself not to come to the UFC earlier uh, and, and decided to stay in the in uh, Cage Warriors, which makes sense because he was getting to be a bit of a star over there. Like you don't typically get to be in the title picture of a of those smaller orgs for very long without the UFC offering to pick you up. It's why those belts never get defended. Like if you look at the lineage of the Cage Warriors welterweight and lightweight titles, the the McGregor belts or the middleweight one. Um, it tends to be like a guy wins it and then he goes somewhere else and vacates and then there's a fight for the vacant belt. I don't think McGregor won either of his off the off like a previous holder. I think he just won them in a vacancy fight. Might be wrong, but certainly one of them he did. But anyway, gave a good interview afterwards, um, made people laugh. Looks like a jacked J from the in-betweeners. So uh, yeah, can't, can't wait to see more of him. What else was on this card? Oh, let's talk about Khalil Roundtree versus Modestus Bukakis. Um, Bukas- Bukaskis. Uh, I was watching this one with the missus because <laughs> she had the idea of doing a uh, explaining MMA to your wife segment, which we might record in the future. But I was like, you're going to have to watch some fights with me to do that. So we were watching this one together. And she was asking me very near the end of the fight. She was asking, why does he keep bouncing his lead leg like that? And... Uh, I said, oh, that's a Muay Thai thing. You know, it, it lets you get to the check quicker if you're if you're dealing with. And all of this was having to have like sub explanations in between the original explanations. But it gets, lets you get to the kick, uh, the check quicker. Lets you push kick quicker. Um, but there's not an awful lot of quick push kicking in MMA. And then wouldn't you know it? He picks it up and stamps on Bukakis's lead leg and um, maims him. But um, this fight was good fun. I thought it was turning into. Khalil Roundtree was dominating the early going, and then there were signs of, Bukas- uh, of Bukaskas coming back. He was doing well landing his jab and getting away afterwards. I thought Khalil Roundtree looked like he was slowing down quite a lot uh, towards the end of that first round. There was talk of him being like more measured and, and reining in towards the end of that second round, but I mean specifically when he was throwing the counters, they looked a bit slow on the, uh, on the um, return. But Bukaskas, like, as my wife pointed out, 
looked absolutely, he was bricking it in the early going, and that's for good reason, because Khalil Roundtree was lighting him up, blew his nose all across his face, uh, was landing really nice counter-right hooks over the jab, um, because Bukowskis was the orthodox fighter, uh, Roundtree was the southpaw, and then Bukowskis just didn't threaten the level change at any point. Roundtree would occasionally like slowly mime the uppercut, which sometimes works, sometimes that gets people to not level change, but... Um, I mean, his corner were begging for him to level change. Just level change into a clinch. You don't need to, like, dive onto his hips or anything. Um, you just need to make him think that you're going to duck in if he throws punches. But, yeah, Bukaskas was not able to do that. Um, and he was just sort of overwhelmed. And then he, I think he was stepping in on a jab because he took the, the side kick to the leg on the side of the leg, which is, I mean... Let's talk about this. Firstly, not an oblique kick, but I did have a rant last week about how I don't care about... Um, terminology but like the oblique kick the low line side kick linear kicks to the front of the leg or linear kicks to the knee joint um have been a sort of point of contention in mma for quite a while it was 2013 when jones was doing them to um rampage just before it might have been 2011 when uh, anderson silva fought damian meyer and desperately didn't want to get close enough to do anything so he was throwing these long side kicks to the lead leg and and the calf kick that was another one that he sort of invented in that fight because he didn't want to get close didn't want to kick riding up into a takedown attempt but yes everyone's been distracted by the calf kick lately being like should we ban that so now we're going back to the uh, the low line side kick and the oblique kick to the knee uh, should we ban those? Now, people have been bringing out like Rampage Jackson in 2013 saying he thinks it's a dirty kick and it should be banned. He thought it was a dirty kick and it should be banned because he didn't know how to deal with it. Like He was just walking onto it over and over again against John Jones. Same with Vitor Belfort. These guys who don't have any like um, clever entries or feints, they'll just walk up to him, plod up to him over and over again. And the foot always has to go first. The, le the lead leg always has to go into range first. So Jones just kicked it and ran away. Um... Rampage Jackson would ban footwork if he could. <laughs> Rampage Jackson wants to just stand and do rock and sock and robots. But um, don't use that as evidence of the kick being deadly. On the other hand, like there are people, the people who are like, ex expecting like inverted knee joint from that Tony Jaa movie, the less successful one than um, Ong Bak, the one where he's like stomping on dude's knees. People who are expecting like inverted knee joints, they're on one end of like the just crazy out there spectrum. But on the other end, there are the people who are like, no, it's not a damaging technique. There has never been anyone hurt from it. <laughs> and yet, no, there have been some serious injuries from it. Um, not just this one, but like uh, Stephen Thompson was out for a while needing a, a ligament surgery on his on his uh, knee because of the Darren Till fight. Stephen Thompson is a guy who could benefit enormously from the low-line sidekick in his game and chooses not to use it because he doesn't like it. He thinks it's unclassy. Um Another one that no one talks about or remembers is Timo Pakalan, uh, who fought Mark Jacquesi. Mark Jacquesi stomped on his lead knee, and uh, Timo, Timo, who had been very cautious up to that point, gets his knee stomped on, hobbles a little bit, and then runs in onto an overhand because he's like, I've got to get something done. I've just felt my knee go. <laughs> and then he was out for the best part of like three years getting MCL surgery and trying to recover with re-injuries and shit like that. So yeah, I mean, it can lead you on a, down a, a sketchy hole of injuries, but so can a lot of different things where you get hit in parts of your body that aren't supposed to be hit. The important point is that these techniques are not unstoppable. I wrote an article in like 2015, 2016 called uh, Stomping the Knee. Oh, and hang on, what is it? It's one of the ones still up at Vice. They've not deleted it yet, so hold on. Stomping the knee, a guide to countering MMA's most ungentlemanly tactic. Uh, I don't personally actually think it's ungentlemanly. I don't care if people kick the knee. But in that article, I talked about some of the most common counters. The most obvious ones are withdraw the fucking leg. <laughs> Pull your leg away. And when you withdraw the leg, it opens up the counter on the same side that the opponent is facing. Whichever way they're, they're side kicking, um, they are throwing themselves in. You can kick them on the open side. And obvious examples are Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whittaker. And that's how uh, Amanda Nunes knocked out Holly Holm. But there's other examples, like, uh, of different techniques, rather. Um, fucking feints. All of these things rely on the opponent timing your lead leg going in. If you're not doing something so fucking obvious, it's not that easy for them to stomp on your lead leg. Um, the the really good example is uh, Rafael Asuncao versus TJ Dillashaw 2. Asuncao's annoying him with this stomp to the lead leg. Dillashaw fakes a step in steps off to the side and comes in again. Or at another point, fakes a step in, uh, and then he reaches down and slaps the kick out of the way with his hand and comes in punching. 
Because it's not unstoppable. Like uh, Oliver Rinkamp, he went for one against um, Danny, can't remember his name, but British lad. And the guy stepped in and punched him in the face basically because his his uh, leg was crumpled up. He he was trying to extend it and it wasn't, uh, the, the kick connected on the leg too early and he, he would have to really like push through it. If you crowd someone, you can stop it too, is what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, there's tons of options. Misdirect it, fucking faint, pull your leg away if you're really worried about it. Throw up counter kicks, make them regret throwing it out. Parry it offline, use your fucking hands. You know, there's not too many guys who are actually using it to set up other kicks that look like it. But it was a good kick from um, Roundtree. It, it, he'd been closing his man down, um, banging him with punches, and he just stomped on his leg and caught it on the side. And we had always said, like, the way that these are going to injure people is not going to be the inverted knee. It's going to be landing laterally on the side of the knee. Um, and I think I said the the one I'm really scared about is, like, getting the side of the knee on the standing leg while someone's kicking. But this was a pretty good example. And you saw it, it went, like, it buckled his knee in. But it wasn't, like, a horrible uh, injury visually. Um, it was all right, but it did enough to finish the fight. So good on Roundtree, um, wins another fight. And again, <laughs> because the guy literally didn't touch his legs. <laughs> Anything else good on this card? Molly McCann versus Gion Kim was fun. They both went at it for five, uh, for three rounds. Um, wasn't always the cleanest, you know, it wasn't a very technical fight, I'd call it. But yeah, you know, you, with a Molly Meatball fight, you typically get um, a good high pace. Jack Shaw versus uh, Ludovic... Shalinian or, or Ludwig Shaolin, as I'm calling him. Um, this is just like, you know, uh, Shaw St. Pierre is, is how I describe it. Just jabs out of range. Uh, and you know how we were talking about, uh, I said you don't need the jab. If you're losing the jabbing exchanges, use other weapons. But the great thing about the jab is that it's the longest punch. It keeps you pretty safe. It keeps you on both feet. So you've got good balance. Uh, and if you start winning with it, the guy has to do other things. And a lot of those involve opening up. So if you're not throwing the jab, maybe you're throwing the right hand. You have to square your body to throw the right hand. You have to get closer to throw the right hand. You're exposing yourself to a takedown attempt or a clinch or counters. Um, but mainly for sure, clinches and takedown attempts. Uh, or you're kicking and you're putting yourself on one leg. So the guy could catch the kick. The guy could step up the middle of the kick. Um, the guy could parry the kick across and come back with counters. Um, you know, in in avoiding the jabbing or like avoiding the straight up jabbing battle, you are conceding to use weapons that also have their downsides. Shaw was landing these jabs. Sh uh, Shalinian would step in to try and crack him with a good right hand, being like, oh, stop fucking jabbing me. And Shaw would drop on his hips and hit the takedown. Pretty uneventful. Um, Jack Shaw, enormously talented, but maybe not the premier fighter in the world in terms of excitement. Mark andre Barrialt versus uh, Lung Lungimbula. This was fun. Actually, no, it wasn't terrifically fun, but the, the fun part was Lunjin Bula's takedowns because we talk about judo and like Ronda Rousey didn't have that level change to get into clinches. Uh, in Lunjin Bula, Lunjin Bula, rather, you see that like he changes levels, comes in on like a double leg or a high double, like, you know, coming up into the clinch and then he hits his, his wicked throws. Like he did a, a double leg into an inside reap, which was lovely, but he also did a double leg to push the guy into the fence and then immediately switch to the hip throw because you can't retreat away once you've hit the fence. Unfortunately, he then gassed the fuck out, <laughs> so he lost the decision. But um, yeah, I thought he had a fun grappling style at least, or, or takedown style. Oh, and then Tom Aspinall's, I suppose, the other one that we should really talk about, because we talked about this a lot in the preview. Um, Sergei Spivak, I said, he's got this horrible habit of standing on the fence, which is exactly what Tom Aspinall did to guys in cage warriors. He'd back him up onto the fence and just batter him. Uh, Sergei, Sergei Spivak decided to go double forearms guard for the entire time and just sort of like crunch down. And the very first punch that Aspinall threw, I was like, oh, if he keeps just throwing against his guard, he might hurt himself here. Um, and then wouldn't you know, at the end of the fight, he goes, yeah, I broke my hand on the first punch. <laughs> I mean, that's the downside. The, the, if the guy goes double forearms and you just try and plow through it, you, you've got a good chance of hurting your hand. That's when those like tap, tap, tap body shot combinations are, are so useful. But the finish was another knee into same side elbow. I think it was the same side punch against Collier. But that's so valuable. You know, it's the Andy Risty staple. Uh, if you hit a guy with a knee, his hands are going to come down slightly, whether or not he wants them to, whether or not he's thinking about blocking something low, he's going to be he's going to be crunched over by the knee in the gut. And you can hit him in the face, which he did. So Sergei Spivak, Spivak's... Uh, <laughs> I was listening to this fight and I was like, don't say anything about finding the chin with Spivak because it's insensitive to his ridiculous Habsburg jaw. But Scouse chins were on point and Habsburg uh, chins were not. 
So that's that UFC card done. What else was interesting? One had an event on. Um, I only watched a bit of it, but they, they have since not only... I mean, one is hilarious to watch anyway, because um, we are months away, I think I said, from uh, Michael Chavello just calling fighters superstars, referring to it, to it as the one universe. I mean, Bellator already does the Bellator Nation thing, which is the lamest thing in the world. But um, one, we're advertising how this Grand Prix, they're doing it so... It's it's a women's, I think, atom weight Grand Prix or straw weight Grand Prix. No, atom weight. And they're doing it so the matchups aren't set, the brackets aren't set. You vote on who fights who next. So they found a way to needlessly complicate a, a tournament structure, which is very simple. And they're acting like they've disrupted the market. <laughs> it's just the most bullshit thing I've ever seen. Um, and then uh, this last Denise Zambuanga, who should have come out to Chumbawamba, but um, Denise Zambawamba, uh, she fought Seohi Ham, who is the like who was ranked as the number one atom weight in the world, and she easily took her down over and over again. Did no damage. Seohi Ham landed some good punches on the feet, but constantly got taken down. Um, and most people felt like Denise Zambawanga deserved the decision. The judges, however many of them are, there are, not showing their working because there's no round by round scoring, gave it to Seohi Ham. This is one where people like. They go, they go like, pride rules, bitch. I want pride judging, closest to finishing the fight. And yeah, probably say Ham was the closest to finishing the fight. But you don't really want that because it's a shit way to judge a fight. Um, so yeah, people complained so much that one basically said they'll overrule the decision. If you put in, like dudes in the chat were going mental, just spamming uh, thumbs down emojis. And if you spam enough thumbs down emojis, one will change because they, and for all the money they claim they're making and, and how they're dominating the world, they are terrified of people getting angry at them. Um, and then the uh, Stan Fairtex fought some no hoper and, and won a split decision, but they're not going to overturn that one because obviously it's Stan Fairtex. Uh, and then in the main event, Zhang Jianan fought Michelle Nicolini. And look out because people are going to start claiming that Zhang Jianan's one of the pound for pound best women in the world. Um, I, I said before this on the boycast, I was like, she really only does the jab and overhand and then the odd stepping up kick. But if you watched her against Tiffany Teo, who was basically just a grappler, um, Tiffany Teo had a fine striking performance against her with just sort of a one-two. Um, Zhang Zhenan's striking is very overrated, uh, in t certainly in terms of like the scope of it. Uh, and then Nicolini came out and in the first minute she was gassed. It was pretty bad. I mean, she's almost 40 now, but she hasn't fought in two years. And if you look at her in this fight versus her against Angela Lee, it's night and day. She was not prepared for this one. Because it doesn't matter how badly you think you're outmatched on the feet. If you gas after the first takedown attempt one minute into the first round, you weren't ready for the fight, probably. But, th I mean, this is where, like, Zhong Jianan's lack of variety shows because Michele Nicolini was literally doing, like, the old Brazilian stance and reached the hands out, trying to reach at Jianan's uh, punches. And Zhang Jianan was throwing a jab overhand every time. The The punch that's worst to reach against is the overhand, and Zhang Jianan still couldn't get her out of there. It was not the best night for women's MMA. And I say that as someone who absolutely adores Michelle Nicolini as a grappler, and in her previous MMA performances, to be honest. Um, yeah. But look out. <laughs> Zhang Jianan will turn up on the MMA fighting pound for pound rankings, along with Kayla Harrison. And then on the men's side, they've got um, Musassi at like number 12, which I feel like some of them might be doing as a joke reference to the podcast. I, I can't tell. Um, and then the other one was Glory, which was quite interesting because, uh, well, one fight on the card, which wasn't a particularly interesting fight, but the referee, who was a stern Eastern European woman, gave a warning for, might have been clinching, can't remember, which, or might have been, oh, I can't remember what it was. Oh, no, it might have been spinning back fists, because everyone's doing spinning back fists with the intention of landing with the forearm and elbow, because you'll cut the opponent in a sport where elbows are illegal. Um, but she gave a warning to this lad, and three of the five judges took it as a point deduction. So <laughs> there's a load of 9-9, nine, nine, um, a load of 9-9 nine, nine scores, but also a 10-9 score or two. Um, it was it was crazy. But the main event was Bader Harry versus a name I'm about to butcher, Arcadius, great name, uh, fuck, Rozcek, Rozek, um, Arcadius, we're going to call him here. But Arcadius, like, Bader Harry came out and he was going jab right straight to the body and building combinations off it, but that right straight to the body, body so money. Dudes don't throw it. And Bader Harry has been murdering people with it for years. He is, he, I put him and Hug as two of the best offensive kickboxers of all time. Um, 
you know, Banner Harry, like, if you cover up momentarily, he will tear you apart. There is no sort of, like, weathering the storm against Banner Harry generally. But he knocks this guy down four times with body shots, I think it was. And Roscheck, he was trying to time inside low kicks on um, Banner Harry's lead leg as he stepped in, which was working quite well, actually, knocking his leg out. Uh, but generally, he was getting beaten up. And then he timed a left high kick as Banner Harry's coming in to, like, swarm on him on the ropes and knocks him out outright. Cut his head open, blood everywhere. Um, amazing. I mean, typical Bad Harry fashion at this point. Do amazing and then we lose by some weird shit. But equally, sort of karma for the years of assaulting random people. Um, but I really liked this. And I've mentioned Andy Hug already this episode, but this reminded me of Andy Hug. He used to do... He'd cover up and guys would just wail on him because he was small for the weight class. And he used to do this thing where he'd go back to the ropes and he'd cover up and then he'd do a lead leg high kick and he'd just pick it up and throw it almost vertical and knock the guy reeling with this high kick coming out of nowhere. And also John Haggerty does a lot of lead leg high kicking going backwards. It's being able to throw up that high kick in a way where the opponent thinks they're safe from it. Bad Harry might not have been making like the conscious decision, like, oh, I think I'm safe from that left high kick now. But in his experience in the gym, he has not been left high kicked while he's murdering people along the fence. Sorry, ropes. Um, it's a really money kick. I used to call it a no shadow kick when uh, Hug did it. I think Remy Bajanski's probably done it a couple of times too. But if you can do it, and especially against the ropes, because one of the great things about going to the ropes is that you can lighten your lead leg and lean on the ropes. As we talk about in the cage, guys doing the teep with their back to the fence, just stand on one leg, prop yourself against the fence, kick with the lead leg. But yeah, if you've not seen that, mental, mental knockout. And an amazing performance by Batter up to that point. But then in the co-main event, Alex Pereira was doing his last kickboxing match, and it was like he was working his last, last shift at the factory. He just, he checked out after the second round. He's just like, he, I mean, he's a fascinating character. Uh, Pereira, his style's very interesting. He he fights with his his like uh, ready to palm things with his gloves, but he fights with his hands quite wide, so that when guys punch through the middle, he can bring in this like six inch left hook, which is all from the the hips and shoulders, uh, and he and he really hurts guys with it. Um, but yeah, he just sort of didn't do enough. He's throwing out like lazy axe kicks to the thigh and stuff, and the uh, the lad he's fighting, Artem Vakatov, who he beat in a very close um, fight for the. Uh, light heavyweight title uh, last time before. But Va Vakatov just starts <laughs> putting out more output and uh, Pereira just sort of lazily lets him get ahead on the scorecards. Uh, it, was, it was really weird. And then he got a point deduction for holding too much too. So he just, he was never going to get the, the uh, victory if he didn't step up the pace and he didn't bother. And at the end he looked surprised. But honestly, with like someone like Pereira, it's kind of a shame when they're forced to come to MMA by the money. Um, and it's a really bad look for Glory when their, their co-main event is this guy being like, yep, nope, this is my last fight, I'm off to MMA. Not an awful lot of people are very hopeful about uh, Pereira's chances, or certainly people in the know, uh, in terms of like, you know, having watched his style and, and seen how he does, and seen what he does. You know, with Israel Adesanya, I didn't realise very early on that he was um, pursuing both careers at the same time. I thought that he was another sort of like uh, changeover fighter, but he was pursuing both at similar times. And... Um, tailoring his kickboxing style for MMA. Whereas with Pereira it is very much a, he's going to have changeover thing. Um, now that's not necessarily a terrible thing because he's originally a changeover from boxing. He took what he had in boxing, which is a great left hook, brought it to kickboxing and, and built a style around it and became a very good kicker and, and general all round fighter. So maybe he can learn it, but I think he's quite, he's like 35, 36. Um, might be getting a bit long in the tooth for this. Oh no, he's only 34. Yeah, that's not too bad. And he's working with Glover Teixeira, so maybe he'll learn some... Well, certainly he'll learn to have people crushing him from the top. But I reckon that'll do us for this week. I'm going to catch up on the pro wrestling from the weekend and probably talk a little bit about it on the Boycast. If you want to support the podcast, get access to the Boycast, the Advanced Striking 2.0 articles and everything else I write and do, become a Patreon boy. If you want to send an email to the podcast, jackslackpodcast.gmail.com and if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Wondering how Habib filming a homeless man doing press-ups for money is any worse than making fighters beg for bonuses than filming their reaction to getting the bonus and putting it all over Twitter. Bless. <laughs>